Okay, so these are all dyes from the yard. This is fig leaves, which give a nice yellowy and yellowy green, depending. And then I don't know if you can see the fern, but the fern is a, it's kind of a russet red. And we have loquat leaves in here. Loquat is actually, it's really beautiful. It's, it's a traditional dye in Japan, and it's right outside the window right here. <laughs> and it's actually, it grows a lot in San Francisco. This is a great place to be a plant dyer because there's such an ongoing growing season. Any type of prunus tree, like this tree here, this is a plum tree. Plum trees actually can create beautiful colors both from leaves and bark. There's a plum. <laughs> and also the skins of plum too. I was a painter in undergraduate and was getting really sick from using the oil paints that I was working with. And so I started doing a lot of experimentation on my own and I found it pretty difficult because it was either the books were really out of date or um, nobody knew exactly how to work with it in the art department that I was at. So I just started experimenting a lot and the more I experimented, the more I started connecting to actually how abundant color is in our environment. Dahlias create really beautiful colors too in the dye pot. So you can get, I mean, the best ones to use are actually the darker colored ones, but you can use the leaves and the stems too. Lavender is an interesting one because you can get yellows to sort of kind of lavender teal colors. And it is a strong antiseptic, so dyeing your textiles with lavender actually can prevent insects, like moths, from eating your sweaters and your silks and other um, particularly protein fibers that might have problems with moths. So these trees, they're 80 plus years old and they're pear trees and I have done a lot of tests, natural dye tests from these leaves and actually recently dyed eight bridesmaid dresses from these trees. It's actually neutral sort of beige color, which is what the bride wanted, but they're really beautiful. They're almost bronze, like they look metallic-y bronze. I started working with particularly farms and people in food and started sharing information and just doing a lot of experimentation. And so you can get some nice reds and pinks from pine cones as well. I mean, a great way of actually discovering um, very local color and fiber and dyes is to do natural history research and history into native peoples and what they would have used. Mud is a good dye too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of mud, mud cloth, for instance. In Africa, they use that a lot. Hawaiians also dye with, well, if you have any kind of iron rich dirt, it can be a nice binder. California poppy is a native plant to California. It's also a native dye color to people of California, and particularly the roots produce a nice yellowy orange. Oh, she's eating, baby. You really want to also think about just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you or healthy. So some plants are obviously very toxic. And that's another reason why I like to work with plants that are known edibles. Nasturtiums are really fun to work with too. You can, you can obviously eat those. They're really spicy. If you pound them into fiber, you can get some really beautiful patterns and almost like the centers of some of the deeper, darker nasturtiums create almost a, like a lapis blue. Come here, come on. Do you see the fern? She loves this. See the fern. These ferns here, it's the source of the materials for one of our dye baths over there. The ferns turn a kind of russet red color and it's probably most likely because of the spores. <laughs> There's also a chemical in the fern that creates a nice dye. Basically, 
you're seeing colors from reds to neutral browns and some darker browns if you modify it. It's interesting because you would think you'd be getting green from everything. <laughs> you would, and it's the hardest color to get actually for um, plant dyes, which is ironic. So all this in here, this is scouring rush. As you can tell by the density, it's, it's a pretty invasive plant, but it creates a nice dye too. I've gotten varying colors actually, but typically you should be getting pinks from it. I've gotten some yellowy, kind of peachy colors too. Green is the hardest color to get from nature, even though it's the thing that we see abundantly. The easiest color is yellow. It's the chemicals that are in the plants themselves, and those chemicals vary, I mean, from tannins to flavonoids, and, you know, that kind of depends on what plant you're dealing with and what color it might produce. Sometimes you'll get really surprising colors from certain plants that you wouldn't expect at all. Like, for instance, avocado pit can create a nice pink. This is the color you get from avocado pit. It's kind of, it's always an interesting process to witness an everyday object in your life, like an onion skin turning into a beautiful golden brown or red. These are from olives. Olives make a blue? Yeah, with iron. These are all from the walnut tree over there. This is a black walnut tree. The leaves are finally back and the leaves actually create some really nice colors. These are the leaves. And black walnut hulls, the outside of the walnut, actually creates a beautiful, dark, very light fast, very wash fast brown. So in this pot, we have fig, fig leaves. Fig can create, if you add a mordant to it, kind of a nice yellow. What's a mordant? A mordant, it's a binder that can help a dye stay fast to a fiber, and that means light fast or wash fast. With the fig, if you add iron to that, it would turn to a green or a deeper dark green. And then some plants actually have mordants in them already. The loquat, if you just wanted it to be a nice pure pink, you don't have to use a mordant. And those are particularly the dyes that I'm interested in working with. The mordants I choose to work with are iron, which you still need to be careful with, but I usually store it in a container in water so you're not actually ever breathing the powder or letting little beings <laughs> breathe powder because it can actually be quite lethal for a baby or a dog. And then in here, this is alum salt. It's a great companion to the natural dyer and can really coax colors out and improve light fastness and wash fastness. So. So let's, let's, let's show Kirsten what's in here. So we have two thrift store items in here. This nice little coat and a silk top, which will both take the natural dyes very well. If you're a plant dyer, you need to know that you're working with natural fibers. And it actually has been soaking in water because water helps the fiber and the dye connect. And we also neutralized it with some nice pH neutral soap and the soap kind of helps, will help the dye molecules find the fiber molecules to and bind. <laughs> Pull this one out. I'm going to a uh, cocktail party tonight, so <laughs> hopefully we can wear this. <laughs> That's the immediacy of being a natural dyer. You just come right to your local source. So I'm going to be putting it in the loquat leaves. So you can kind of get a look here. We are going to stick this in. It's a nice color. It's actually, it's nice to actually move the fiber around. I mean, this is also a good benefit of working with a non-toxic dye that doesn't include a mordant, which this one has no mordant. It's already in the leaf itself. No added mordant, no metal mordant. So I can kind of move the fiber around. It's actually a really nice, strong bath in there. And plants, I mean, it's also interesting working with plant colors because at different points of year, color will be stronger than at other points or at different points of ripeness. So you also want to think about um, or work with the seasons, much like food. You can see how this has just been a few minutes, um, but the longer, typically, you let something sit. The nicer, deeper color you will get. This is 
The shirt is dyed with black walnut and oak galls. You can see that. Actually, this is from our current collection, but it's natural black alpaca, the top, and then it's dyed with sour grass, or oxalis it's called, and then the bottom is dyed with avocado pit. Yeah. Mm. You like that one, huh? This is the one she likes to wear. <laughs> this dress is dyed with Japanese maple leaf. Natural dyes have a natural varying quality to it that can almost make it a bit more subtle at points. And this sweater is actually dyed with elderberry, but also even brighter and more alive. It's literally living color. This is dyed with avocado pit. The bonnet. In the molecules, you're seeing the color itself. So for instance, if you're looking at a blue, you might also see the opposite of that blue color in there as well. Or if you're, you're looking at something that contains red, you might also see some cool tones. These sweaters are from the clothing line that I have with my dear friend and collaborator, Casey Larkin. This is dyed with blackberry. And then this is dyed with red cabbage. Red cabbage was one of the first dyes I really started working with. <laughs> this is also red cabbage. During World War II, it was sort of common knowledge that you could use red cabbage as a way to dye your clothing. You know, that was our grandparents, and now in our day and age, it's, people are so odd, including myself, when I first realized that. And that was kind of a political moment for me, even, to kind of bring back that knowledge and that diversity of the source of our materials. This cabbage is actually from my uncle's biodynamic farm in Maine, and it's one of my favorite. You can get varying colors of um, red cabbage depending on the soil it's from or grown in. And so I like knowing that this came particularly from our family's farm. This is actually avocado pit, and it's like bleached out. This is from our AD and George collection. And AD is my grandma and George is Casey's grandpa. So it's going back to that idea of in only a couple generations. You can forget even though you inherit a lot from your forebears and your grandparents. And my grandma is definitely one of my creative muses. So this is my wedding dress with a tiny bit of natural dye on the edge of the sash. My husband's tie and the edge of the sash of this dress were dyed with, with um, lichen that we collected up in the Sierras. I love the color. Actually, I really like the way that this turned. It's kind of the color of the fruit, actually. Yeah, it is, right? With synthetic dyes, you're often getting a flat color, a pre-made color that is not, it doesn't contain as much diversity and it doesn't have the living dye molecules. So actually, you know, if you, for instance, for mine and my husband's wedding, I dyed all of the bridesmaid dresses with wild fennel and it was actually held outside and the color really vibrated with the actual natural landscape. So it almost looked like they were a glow. It's really actually quite difficult to photograph natural dyes unless you're in natural light because the colors change so much, which adds a lot of depth to um, wearing natural dye. It's a continual process of exploration and I mean, it's amazing what you can lose in just a couple of generations, you know, so. I like to kind of bring back that knowledge and that diversity of the source of our materials and also particularly non-toxic materials, which is really important for clothing and textiles because they're on our bodies all the time, that we start to experiment with more safer choices for our color and that can still be really beautiful and varied. You don't want to ever shock your fiber, so you want to have sort of lukewarm water and a little pH neutral soap to just neutralize the fiber in the dye and then you just let it hang to dry and you're good to go. It's a really pretty amazing process. I'm going to be able to wear this today.